And we are proud to welcome you in to another edition of The Meltdown Live here with you on a bunch of different platforms. Today on The Meltdown, Tyler and I are headed to a pretty distinct double feature tonight. Maybe we will fill you in on what we're seeing. Conan O'Brien is officially returning to The Tonight Show. Disney CEO Bob Iger got the win yesterday, but now what? One of John's favorite TV shows may have a little life injected back into it, and before he heads off to the Music City, Luntz's List profiles five of his favorite movie soundtracks. It's all coming up right here on The Meltdown, presented by my bookie, broadcasting live from the Culver Studio. Two big balls in a tiny studio, teaching you and me about everything they know to me sound. A meltdown. That was a very dramatic fade there, John. I thought you were going to start talking again. Sorry. Oh, you're okay. I was just, I was excited about it. And then it was just very sudden and Sorry. I wasn't ready to depart with the fade, but I want to welcome all of our lovely Meltonians to the chat and to the live stream. Thank you for being here on Twitch, X, Facebook, Twitter, which is already X and YouTube. We appreciate it very much. Thank you for making us a part of your daily routine. We are on the road to 2000 subscribers hoping to get there sometime this summer season and would love your support. If you have not already subscribed, make sure you hit the thumbs up on this video helps us very much. I am Tim Melton. The other half of the meltdown that is John Lunsford Lunsford. You do the same weird head thing every single time I toss it over to you. Sorry. I don't know where that came from, but this is what I want to start with. Okay. You're headed on a quick trip to Nashville. What's going on? I am going to see the Preds. You can't really tell. It kind of has a really small logo on that. That's Pekka Rene. Greatest What's goalie of all. <laughs> Pekka Rene. Okay. The way you. Greatest goalie of all sound. time. Yeah. Go Preds. Uh, it yeah. Sounded Big like, Pekka fan. It sounded like an Italian <laughs> dish at a stripper joint. It's That's what Pekka it sounded Rene. like. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, he is uh, finished. But anyway, going to see the Preds, um, the one professional team I support. I really only support two teams fully through and through. Tim, you all right? That would be my alma mater, such a, Alabama. This is such a gag fest. This is what this is. I, I, you flip flop between team to team to team in the no, NFL. I have never done that in the NHL. From day one, I have been a Preds fan. Everything else is just whatever. And then I, don't I care. thought professionally we were on the same page of supporting the <laughs> Oakland slash Las Vegas A's. I thought that that was happening. Well, okay, but they're going to Sacramento for a hot second. I don't know if you saw that. They're what? They're, <laughs> <laughs> basically everything's gotten so south in Oakland. They're moving to Sacramento for a little bit. So they're the Sacramento A's and they're going <laughs> to, it's like a rental house. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they're going to keep Oakland when they go to Sacramento or they're going to actually change to Sacramento and rebrand everything. And then they're not going to Vegas. I think till 2028 now yeah, yeah. because it keeps dragging out with the, the, uh, we're stadium. diehards. There is a hot, uh, I mean, th- there's a chance that the A's go somewhere else. There's a chance the Royals, could go somewhere else because Kansas City's had basically, I don't know if it was a vote or whatever, but a lot of stuff got shot down in Kansas City to help stadiums. It could hurt the Chiefs, and it could hurt the Royals. And so what's the city everybody starts talking about when it comes to baseball? Nashville. 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 So I feel like if the Royals move to Nashville, we got to switch to that instead if it happens, okay. especially if it happens before the A's have right, made their way to Vegas. But I don't like baseball. I have been very vocal about my dislike of baseball. I'm becoming a Las Vegas A's fan with you because they are the absolute worst team to ever play any professional sport ever. So we might as well jump on now because it ain't jumping on the bandwagon. I was a Titans fan. I fell off because the Titans are one of the worst organizations, worst run organizations in the history of everything. And I don't really care about the NBA. You know, I'm not a big NBA person, but the one team, the one professional team I have supported from day one, it's the 25th anniversary, by the way, Hell yeah! of the Nashville Predators. Okay. It's them. So I go to Preds game. I try to go whatever to whatever helps you sleep at night. I try to whatever. go to, to like four or five games a year. However, this year with getting this started and everything, I haven't been able to go as much. Playoffs will start right about the time I'm having nose surgery, so I can't go to the playoffs what? with my nose all huh? <clears throat> with what? I didn't hear you. Nose I know surgery. you're having a nose job. I am having a nose job at the end of the month. That's right about the time hockey playoffs start, so I would not be able to go to a playoff game. I've tried to go to a playoff game as well. Yeah. They will make the playoffs. Most likely they haven't out there not locked in yet, but they're the number one wild card team. Do you find so, yourself missing Pekka? I do miss Pekka. Yeah. UC Soros is good. Yeah. Their current goalie. 
Um, but Kevin Lankinen is okay. I would love much more if they had a nice 50-50 split like they had at the end of Rene's career. I'm out. Pekka Rene has a lot of Dirk Nowitzki to him. From okay. his from his attitude, his game, what he's continuing to do for the franchise. They both played, I think, 20 years. Like There's there's a lot of Dirk Nowitzki to him. I know you will never become a Preds fan, nope. but there's a lot to respect about Pecorini in the same way that I will respect a player like Dirk Nowitzki as well. Go Stars. That's the appropriate answer here. And we've got to yeah. eventually make our way to a Predator Stars game. We say we're going to do it every year, but yep. we're always busy. So who who do the Predators play tonight? The St. Louis Blues. Who are dun, trying, dun, 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 dun. trying to work their way in the playoffs. Probably not going to make it. It's probably going to be Vegas and Nashville, the two wild card One teams. of our poker players is a big St. Louis Blues fan. So yes. that will be interesting to hear about your trip to Nashville. But you will be on the show tomorrow. This is going to be a I quick trip. Be. Go up tonight. Leave the minute the show's over. Game's at 7. Haul back tomorrow and be here for the Meltdonians. Producer hmm. Tyler is here. I think we have Tyler. There's Tyler. We officially have a Silver Surfer casting, Tyler. Yes, we do. Uh, Julia Garner, also known as Ruth from Ozark, has been cast as the Silver Surfer that's in the MCU. That's how I know her. That's, yeah, that's how, how I, I know her, her as well. Ruth from Ozark. That's all I know. And she's, not Ruth that played Madonna. Was she supposed to be Madonna? Was she supposed to be Madonna? That show yeah. on um, Netflix where she was the um, she was in Waco on Netflix. Uh, the lady that stole the identities, fake woman. She's in prison oh, now. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. That was uh, her next big hit after Ozark. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't like that show. Um, she doesn't do it for me. Awful casting, I think. I have no problem with it being a woman with the because there is a comic storyline where that happens, but everybody else they've announced for the Fantastic Four, I'm all in on, but not this one. Well, we'll see exactly how maybe she surprises you in that role because she was fantastic in Ozark, but I haven't been able to really distance her from that show, and I'm sure she's happy that this casting has taken place for a number of reasons, including maybe trying to get away from being typecasted to other Ruth-type roles. I uh, am sure that she wants to have sort of a breakout Hollywood moment, and this is her opportunity for that. Rockstar's back with us. Conan Morning. O- How are you? Morning. Conan O'Brien <laughs> has set a return to The Tonight Show. I don't know if you've heard about no, this. No, I love Conan. What's, give me the news. He's set to appear on next week's April 9th broadcast. The team at Variety reports that the occasion will mark the comedian and former late-night host's first time back on the program since his controversial exit from NBC back in 2010, in which he was replaced by Jay Leno as the show's host following a six-month tenure. I'm still mad about this. I'm, All these years later, I'm still angry about it. I, I'm guessing he's pushing for the new show he has on Max, but I don't understand the angle of going on The Tonight Show and doing it. Um, is it really, he was on an episode of Curb. Conan doesn't need the pub, doesn't need The Tonight Show right now. So I don't know what the point of it is <laughs> seeing this show he's doing on max where he's traveling the world yeah. and then randomly appearing on curb and i guess with this despite all the history that is there with him it's almost like i'm bored what do y'all want me to do i can go do i can yeah, go do and, stuff and i don't Fallon. have my show anymore so let's go do it o'brien and nbc sort of made up a, a while ago because they basically knew they did him dirty and said hey would you like the rights to a lot of your old stuff back yes that is like the number one thing i'd love the Great. things that i built to be able to use those in the way in which I want to use them. They ended up agreeing to that, and they've been peachy pretty much ever since. Good. Also, you can look at this thing from how it ended, and O'Brien probably benefited long-term from being Financially, able to go yes. off and do his own thing. He made so much more money doing it that way. He was able to find things to do that maybe he wouldn't have found if he had been tied to that traditional Tonight Show hosting gig. And it worked out for Jimmy Fallon, too. It worked out for the network. It, it worked out for everybody. It did, but his dream job was... Yes. Hosting The Tonight Correct. Show. Hosting the show that Johnny Carson Correct. hosted when he was a young tot, watching that with his dad, and it meaning something very powerful to him. And he wanted to bring all of his friends along for that ride. And the minute he gets in the door, they're like, you know, Jay Leno's kind of not doing so well in the primetime slot. This didn't work out as well as we'd hoped. All right. And he had the number one rating, and we're just going to put him back in the role. We can't have the new guard come in. I know we promised you this many years out, but Jay's willing to come back, and I think that's what we're going to go with. I think he's probably best for the one brother one Exactly. Let me tell you, I was just heartbroken as a 
Conan O'Brien diehard who would stay up on school nights and watch Conan O'Brien, late night with Conan O'Brien. I wanted my guy to finally get his shot. And that passing of the torch moment where Conan went on The Tonight Show with Leno and Leno's like, this will be great in five years. They shook hands and then five years passes. Conan held up his end of the deal. He gets The Tonight Show and he was undermined almost from the get on this thing. And I'm still angry about it because I was rooting for my guy, and then he got ripped off of television, and Jay Leno came waddling back on. Yeah, but what would you? I'll never do? forget the feeling I had. What would you do if you were in the position of Jay Leno at the time? You don't need money at that time. No, you're you're, you're just doing to stay on. Just like let me just kind of do a little just prime time you know what show I would for do? a little while. But just I know, like guys, you know that everybody thinks I snuck in this job from took this job from Dave Letterman at first, and I'm going to sneak in and get Conan out again after six months, like. What would you do in that position? Like, I have enough money. Go I don't build, need. Go build your own thing. Yeah, I don't need. I'm gonna go. What's he on? Like CNBC now, talking cars. What's he doing now? Yeah. Go, go to Fox. Yeah, I think he's and still doing Jay show. Leno's garage. It's my, it's my garage. It's just my car. Yeah. Well, yeah. they had called Kimmel, and they were like, <laughs> "Hey, we're gonna put Leno on before you as a lead-in. Yeah. Are you cool with that?" And you know, Kimmel was like, "Well, you know, whatever it takes to make things happen." It worked out for everybody long term, but in the moment. It was one of the dirtiest things mm -hmm. I've seen in show business. There's a book on this that I absolutely love. And when I'm wanting to be in an angry mood, I go back to read it because it just is a, it's such a dirty mood, thing. <laughs> the War for Late Night is what it's called. And it's a great book. I forget who, who wrote it. I just like your Jay Leno fantastic. sounds like Family Guy's version. Of Jay Leno. <laughs> I've seen the same thing, John. It's caricature of Family Guy. <laughs> so he'll be back on as a guest next week. It will sort of bring all those emotions back up in me is something I've been really passionate about as a Conan guy, but I think he's doing it to close a chapter officially. I think that's yeah. why he's going on there. It's not necessarily for just the pub, but I promise you this, the publicist behind this new show probably is like, yeah. this is one of the best things that we can do is have him go back into a situation where it was very tumultuous. And now it's going to sort of resurge a lot of energy going into this new show called Conan O'Brien must go as this is about O'Brien traveling around the world, different locales, and it debuts on Max on April 18th. Honestly, some of his best stuff from his show yeah. was when he would go out of the country. So the fact that there is a whole HBO series dedicated to this, or also he probably can do a lot more being on HBO as opposed to being on cable. I can't wait for that. Well, the rumor was it was going to be a variety show, and then they changed it to the destination show because he's been in talks with this Max thing for a while when he left TBS, and the, the, the podcast just blew up. He didn't – nobody expected that podcast to blow up. So he's got that – like, that seems like that's the main focus right now. Like, I'll, I'll do a show on the side. we got to do pre-tape, though. Let's get into a couple of comments here from the chat. We have – let's see. We have Justin who says, have you all been watching Three Body Problem? Really enjoy it four episodes in. I have heard nothing but great things about this show on Netflix. Is this Benioff and Weiss? This is Benioff and Weiss. From Game of Thrones. It's got a few Game run? of Thrones people in it, too. It's an incredible show. I, I've heard it's tremendous. How far are you into it? I finished you it. You finished it? Yeah. So you would highly there, recommend there's this There's three thing. books. This is the first book. Mm -hmm. So it definitely leaves off like, hey, there's a chance for more. I don't think they've renewed it yet. They're probably kind of waiting a month or two to see how it does. But it is a really good show. It's full sci-fi. So not probably not your thing, but it's really, really good. And... I am not as down on Benioff and, and Weiss as everybody else is after Game of Thrones because I say when they had source material to work from, they knocked it out of the park. They're great at adapting. When that ran out, that's when it fell off a cliff because it's like, hey, guys, make it up as you go along pretty much. This is adapting from a Chinese trilogy that exists, and so they were able to adapt a book very, very, very well. Well, I have not started it yet. Have you started it, Tyler? Three by I problem? haven't. I've same as you, though, I've only heard good I've things. I've only heard good things. See it. Rockstar, do you know anything about this? I saw a trailer, and I was like, "There's this is just way over my head. So give <laughs> us just, if, can you, in just a couple of sentences, give us the premise of this? Um, basically, the, <laughs> well, basically, a bunch of scientists are start getting confused across the world because science doesn't work anymore. Like, the science and formulations and everything they work, they don't, it doesn't work anymore. And they're trying to figure out why. And all the while, these physicists get these, like, uh, virtual reality looking headset things to play a game and they have no idea why. And so the whole thing is figuring out why does science not work and why do we have these headsets? And it kind of starts explaining things from that point. 
Okay. That doesn't make a lot of sense when I say it out loud. You it just doesn't. Have, you just have to watch it. <laughs> watch the trailer. And, and and understand. I mean, the trailer kind of tells you that, and the trailer leaves a lot out that I didn't realize the show was going to eventually turn into. It kind of sets up the first, like, three or four episodes, and then it really gets deep after that. We have Then Zach, it gets deep. Yeah, then it gets deep. We have Zach that says the A's color scheme is still top-notch. I agree with that. Also, uh, part of one of the best baseball movies of all time in Moneyball. Yeah. Let's see. We have Charles who says three episodes into three a body problem and it's really good so far. That's promising. And then we have you saying I finished it a few days ago. So there you <laughs> go. Should have read that one. Uh, let's see. We have Brian who says couldn't tell you the last time I was up around 10 30 PM and went, Ooh, I need to watch a talk show. That is the new landscape. It's all built for YouTube the next day. If it's really good, it'll pop up there in your algorithm. But I have a feeling there'll be a lot of people not watching Conan O'Brien at, uh, at late night, live but we'll watch it the next day on youtube and it will be a storyline there that other people definitely pick up on we have troy who says has anyone else checked out x-men 97 which is on disney plus i have not checked it out yet but i already hear they're developing season three of this thing that they've already basically (laughs) laid the pathway for season three is going to be a thing and we haven't even got through all of season one has anybody checked out x-men 97 yet nope nope I was going to, can I go real back to the Conan thing real quick? Please. With this, not just Conan, the way that late night is laid out now, would you be more nervous if it was Johnny Carson days, like where like the comedian, I'm live, almost all of America is watching me right now live, so I've got to be good. Or today's thing was, Tim, do you think what I did today was good enough to be viral tomorrow? Nobody's really watching it now. They're going to watch it tomorrow. Did I do good enough tonight when you're going to replay and try to make a viral clip? Which is more nerve-wracking so, to you, to me, succeed live now right. or wait till tomorrow when people start It's a great question it. because both are totally different eras. It almost feels to me like apples and oranges because what Carson benefited from more than anything was a lack of competition. Correct. So he had all those eyeballs on him because it was looked at as the predominant show, and he helped reinforce that. But there were so few options for people to enjoy – that that's one of the only places they could turn to, so their expectations were much lower, even though Carson is. delivered. YouTube, there's a million different possibilities Correct. of rabbit holes you can go down, and they do have to pop out with what is the most exciting piece of content that we can do. So, to answer your question, I would say it'd be much more daunting today to yes, try to generate YouTube clicks tomorrow, even though you get a chance to perfect it, get it right, schedule it, write it, whatever, and basically... Like, it's, it's a similar thing with SNL. Yeah. Is it tougher to be on that original cast on a show that, yes, there's much fewer options, but it has never been proven? Or is it tougher to be Andy Samberg and come right. in and do vignettes that you do have time and you have some resources to create, but you've got to deliver every single right. time? you got to hope it's viral. Same yes. kind of thing on YouTube. So it's... That's a, that's a bad... Just going to sleep at night going like, I don't think it was good enough. Not, I don't think that's going to hit tomorrow. Because <laughs> like, the truth is... I couldn't tell you the last time I turned late night on, Correct. actually turned late night on on a network. I couldn't tell you the last time I actually turned SNL outside of it comes on after the Notre Dame game on NBC on Saturdays in, co- in college football. Outside of that, I never turn it on. But if I turn on, if I open up YouTube the next day, which I will do, if it doesn't pop up, I won't see it. So I got to hope it pops up there. Yeah. I'll tell you what CBS got right. They realized James Corden was going to be one of those guys that could produce those viral hits the next day because no one was going to be watching that show live anyway. It's the fourth Correct. choice of the night. <laughs> it's the fourth choice. Even the backup NBC show was looked at as being more valuable than the backup CBS show. Think about Carson Daly. It was the fifth choice of the night because <laughs> you got ABC with Kimmel. So he had to deliver viral moments the next day, and he did that repeatedly over and over and over again. And I think the burnout from that was very real. I think it tested his character. I think it tested his persona. I think it tested everything about him. And there's a reason why, out of all those groups of next ones up, he's gone. He's not there anymore. If you ever want a chance to laugh, go to his Ask Me Anything on uh, Reddit. Uh, James is not known to be a nice guy, and he didn't ask me anything. And there was not everything was, can you comment about how everybody hates you? Do you remember this waiter that went off on you, this airport? Like, he just stopped answering questions. I, When it comes to late-night television, though, I will tell you right now, 
the clubhouse leader for my favorite movie of the year so far is Late Night with the Devil. I was about to say, Carson had competition that one night. Yeah, Jack, Jack Delroy, yes, with Late <laughs> Night with the Devil, which is overperforming in almost every regard and a movie that I recommend, even though you go on Letterboxd and you read the reviews about it, and it, all it is is people trashing it for using the AI imagery in those stagnant, mm. we'll be right back, screenshots that are featured in there and i mean maybe shouldn't have done that but oh i agree you shouldn't have done that which is another thing that keeps it from getting almost a perfect review from me for me but it still is such a good movie and i think tyler you highly recommend it as well i do and i just cannot for the life of me understand why they got why they just used ai for those three it's three like interstitial images that are meant to break up segments in the uh, show in the movie yeah, why would you? You could easily get a graphic design major to do that for a couple hundred bucks. You don't need AI for that. Well, they definitely took a a route that probably cost them a lot in the long run trying to take a shortcut. We have Jody who asked Tyler, "Are you all caught up on Shogun?" What is the answer to that, Tyler? Uh, I responded to Jody in the chat, and I said, I'm two episodes behind, planning to catch up this weekend. And he responded back, saying the last two episodes that have aired are incredible. I have heard Three Body Problem is just wonderful, and I've heard Shogun is wonderful. And I've been watching The Gentleman on Netflix trying to work my way through that at a snail's pace because I'm consuming as much as I possibly can right now. Going to be doing that more of that this evening. I'll tell you what that is in a second, but... I, there's so much good TV, and the problem is there's another wave of good TV making its way here in June where you're going to have the next season of The Bear. You're going to have House of the Dragon Season 2 coming up. You're going to have the S- Star Wars Acolyte show on Disney+, mm-hmm. Plus that we got to watch. There's going to be a lot to consume for sure. By the way, final episode ever of Curb Sunday. Oh, no. So it's ending. The era is... It's been a really good season so far. I need to finally start Curb. It's good. It's one of the greatest shows ever. So one thing that we talked about here with The Tonight Show is the succession plan that was put into place, trying to pass the torch from Leno to Conan and how poorly that went. And that is what Disney is sort of facing right now when it comes to their CEO position. It was a little bit of an issue before with Bob Iger moving on to Bob Chapek. And obviously the global pandemic didn't help anything at all. Bob Iger had to come back in. Chapek was fired during the middle of an Elton John concert, Mm. which is kind of a true story there because it happened while they were airing a live Elton John concert on Disney+. Disney CEO Bob Iger said, quote, the board's number one priority now is finding his successor. He went on to say a bunch of other stuff, but the proxy fight is over. Succession is the board's number one priority, saying the board search committee to find a CEO successor that seven times in 2023 and plans to meet even more frequently this year. Quote, they're treating it with a sense of urgency because it is so important. The board is taking it very, very seriously because I'm not going to be here forever. He declined to provide a timeline for the selection of a new CEO. His contract extension with Disney runs through the end of 2026 saying, quote, I think it's really important to have a good transition process. You know, this is a big, complicated company. And not only is it important to choose the right person, but it's really important to give that person all the opportunity in the world to be successful in the job. And the board's very focused on who the person is and when the decision should be made and essentially how the handover of sorts will take place. Both you and I are believers in Bob Iger and what he did to build Disney to its absolute peak. But John, I think we both agree that Disney's been in free fall ever since the pandemic from that level of success, that top tier level of success. And Bob Iger right now is trying to play cleanup duty. He's facing fights from within that he just won. But who the next person is that's going to take over this role is undoubtedly something that the company has to get right to sustain itself with all these different ventures and all these different things they're trying to produce for a mass amount of people. I just hope the focus is not so much on who is next that the current problems don't get fixed before who is next comes in. Because if you say, hey, who's next? Good luck. It's on fire. Good luck. I, I'm not going to give you a you know, hose to put it out, but good luck. Because that's kind of how things were. Chapek kind of set it on fire. Bob Iger came in. He's like, don't worry, guys. I'll fix it. But fixing it is not, 
here's the perfect person to come fix it. I think Iger is the perfect person to come fix it. Do so. He's done with fights. He has he some of the battles he had to fight. Fix it and then worry about it. It wouldn't shock me if that 2026 date moves you know back a little bit because there's got to be some fixing and you can't fix it in you know a couple of years. But I mean, they obviously need to keep working on this. I just hope it's not the only focal point because there are a lot of people, good people in Disney as well that could go to. As long as it's not Jimmy Pitaro because they don't need to go anybody ESPN. But outside of that. There's a lot of people even even within Disney you can go to, and I don't don't stay within Disney necessarily. Go look outside, see if you find somebody. I am not going to be shocked if they sell ESPN very soon because ESPN continues to lose subscribers with the cable packages where they're paying for ESPN. They don't even know it. Cable packages are falling off. People are canceling in mass amounts. The worse the economy it gets, the more cable subscriptions will be canceled. And ESPN, they're they've really been able to benefit from having that money tied directly to the money that's coming in to produce programming. And you're going to see, we've already seen massive layoffs from ESPN with big time talent and big time contracts. You're potentially going to see even more of that, especially since now, John, the landscape has completely changed. They are facing competition from non-traditional television providers like Amazon, like Netflix that are scooping up these giant sports events and feeding it directly to the consumer do you overall like tuning in on a Thursday night and watching the NFL game on Amazon? Because I love it. I love it. I mean, it, of all the broadcasts I could watch of an NFL game, it is probably the best. But the problem is, since they have taken over, the Thursday night schedule has not been stellar. Putrid. Last year, not this past year, but the year before when they started, was abysmal. Now, people tuned in because it was the first time on Amazon. This past year, they elevated a little more with what they could provide with the technology Amazon has and made it a little bit better where the game's a little bit better too, to where it was more worth tuning in. Now, I think the absolute best option for ESPN, for Disney and for ESPN and the sports rights, which they hold a lot of sports rights, is for Apple to come in, write a check, and Apple to say, let us make ESPN 1,000% integrated in our tech and make it work for people. That brand still holds tremendous value with sports consumers. The brand is worth so much, even if the pieces that make up the brand are expendable in a lot of different cases. Rockstar, one thing I hate, and maybe I'm being a little bit of a homer here. I know that we're right down the hall from the studios. I know I'm wearing the hat. But honestly, I would say this. If I wasn't here, I promise you this. Okay. I hate the argument for the sake of an argument shows the hot take shows the skip bayless shows the stephen a smith shows those shows that clog up what i think used to be a very stellar brand that used to provide real actual discussion and is now just how do we get clicks on the internet it goes right back to the late night wars of how do we get clicks on the internet is what the game has become it's that same way for espn i don't feel like the next round is that type of show i feel like the next round is actually a show discusses things that not only do we care about here, especially in the South, but has a a level of sophistication to it to where it can be totally silly one moment and totally serious the next and not feel jarring at all. What do you think about all these shows on ESPN? Do you watch any of them ever that are just two talking heads yelling at each other constantly? I stop watching. It's also the political stuff, too. The political news channels. It's uh, clickbait and and stuff like that. For example... um, the last thing I used to watch on ESPN was Pardon the Interruption. Uh, that's the one I would watch, but I don't like the argument. I don't like the fact that it's almost like, uh, Tim, do you think LeBron should retire today? And you say yes. It's like, well, damn, I agree with you, so we can't really argue. Exactly. <laughs> so will, yeah. you, will you fight against it, though? But I don't really believe that. But it, nobody's going to watch me and you agreeing that LeBron should stay as long as you like it. So that's what they want. ESPN is like, that's the only thing is Stephen A. Smith. He's loud and obnoxious. People hate him, but they're watching him. The Howard Stern thing. Well, we just want to see what he says next. Skip Bayless. I just want to see what crazy thing. I'm going to follow him on Twitter because he says crazy outlandish things. Colin Cowherd. That's how they make their living, and that's the new thing. And it's just you don't want to do that because it's not genuine. I guess it's getting you money. But, like, if we came in one day and, like, Dunaway, you got to, for some reason, you got to pull against this, and then Lance is going to take this side. Well, I don't really believe that. Yeah, but people – just sell it, right? And we're going to get clicks because it will go viral because this guy got so animated about this one point, and this guy was fighting the other point. It was so entertaining, and they're like, "Well, now we're that show," because we see and that we've got 
hundreds of thousands of views on that one argument. That's what people want to see. So let's uh, adapt to that. I crave, every day it's got to be obnoxious. I crave authenticity in everything that I consume. I crave it in everything I consume. And I, and I know we watch a lot of fictional things, but I'm talking about, I crave something being connective in a real way. Organic. Organic, purposefully original. I, I, I don't like seeing orchestrated drama for the sake of orchestrated drama and ESPN Guess what? They did it once, and they said, okay, there's something here. They did it twice. They did it 10 times. They did it 1,000 times, and now it's consumed what I feel like is the entire product, and I cannot stand it, John. I know you feel pretty passionately about this subject as well. What got you into sports broadcasting, and what has sort of deterred your interest in consuming it on the level in which you used to? What got me into sports broadcasting was – my dad actually did a, a racing show on jocks back when I was little. So I was like, oh, this is cool radio. That's, that's cool. And then um, in college, when I got hurt, um, playing at Birmingham Southern, I got hurt and could not play in 2008. And so they're like, hey, you want to help out with our coaches show? And they had a coaches show that came on after the old Jefferson Pilot game uh, that used to be like that morning SEC game. And so I started doing that. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then I was driving to practice one day. I heard Ian and Lance doing their show. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I need an internship desperately so i'm gonna go intern with them and then i met rockstar and the rest is history um so really it's all rocky's fault that i'm here yes, but you're welcome buddy <laughs> but, welcome aboard yeah um <laughs> but you know i've stuck with it because there is value in sports broadcasting or else i would not have kept doing it for so long but you know what hit i outside of the next round i do not consume sports outside of live games right that's because the value that's the value because direct to consumer we're going to present you the thing you actually want to see which is why apple would be genius i think and i just think they're the best option but whether it's amazon apple netflix whoever to buy espn gain those rights and throw the rest in the trash honestly because they take those rights you have your apple plus subscription or netflix or amazon prime or whatever it may be that's where you go to watch the SEC football games. That's where you go to watch the NFL game, whatever it may be, and throw the talking heads because they don't really need that. They have their original oh. programming. And honestly, Apple makes the vast majority of their money from this stuff. But, to there's, see. but there's always going to be that one guy that goes, hey, we're getting all these views from these live games. What if we just do it differently? We have a guy like Stephen A. Smith to have his own. That's going to happen. He's going to have his own show, his, his exclusive show on Apple twice a week. And it's going to start like that, where there's always got to be a talking head. Always. I do think to the, show the drama in sports and everything else. I do think the best content from even people like Stephen A. Smith is when they get away from doing their first take style shows and it's just him doing a podcast, sitting down, doing a legit interview yeah. one on one. That is not the, oh my God, that's going viral. That's like, hey, that's actually a pretty good conversation. And sometimes it goes viral, but not always. But there's so many good smaller things that you pull from ESPN that's like, if you focus on that and had that as like the, hey, you may get a viral moment from it or something like that, and you stick to the live sporting events, and Sports Center I think, is the biggest question mark of if a streaming provider, if they sold off ESPN, it wasn't just a cable channel anymore because that still has value, I think, of news of the day for sports. But See, I feel like there's I just not a place for that. Scott Van Pelt is wonderful at what he does because when he talks to me about sports, I feel it from his heart. I do. I just, yeah. to me, he's got it. He's got it. He's doing it the right way. Let me ask you about this elephant in the room. And no, it's not Mick. I want to ask you about this. <laughs> I was about to say, we have a show mm. called that. No, Pat Mack. Subscribe to Roll Tide Pods. They thought since we can't create authenticity anymore, we've gone so far down the rabbit hole of just person A and person B yelling at each other. Doesn't matter what they where they came from, it doesn't matter what their background is, it doesn't matter what their ties are or anything, as long as they can yell and they can do it in a very interesting way and be there ready to fight, we're ready to throw them in there. Pat McAfee felt like to me, since they can't develop authenticity themselves, they decided to go buy it. Buy it, yeah. And I actually do believe McAfee is the way he is on camera, which is why his audience has grown the way it has. Because I believe that's the guy on air and off air it's the same dude. Another Bob Iger purchase, by the way. Love him or hate him, I feel like McAfee is authentic. And there's a lot of moments that you wouldn't get from other personalities if McAfee had not been on the set during whatever segment is that's been memorable on ESPN for the past year. Now, I'm also a wrestling guy. WWE knew this before ESPN. 
They brought McAfee in. Yep. He was a giant fan, obviously. <clears throat> but they have he, – he feels at home there because you are allowed to be your – the best version of your personality on their airwaves. And they want him to be as authentic as possible. They still wasted a Royal Rumble spot on him this year, but we won't get into that. <laughs> when he really Where do you should stand have gone in and fought because he fought at WrestleMania anyway. Where do you stand on McAfee when it comes to the hate he gets, but also the value that he brings because I don't consider him as being part of the problem. No, no, no. McAfee has a vibe about him that I can understand rubs people the wrong way. I totally get if you're a game day person and you're more of a traditional game day person, college game day, I mean, and he comes in with being himself. He continues to be that on college game day. And boy, it is a total 180 from Lee Corso, who can hardly wake up in the morning. Kirk Herbstreet, who's more reserved in what he does. Desmond, and then, of course, Reese. Everything's more like, now Alabama's playing Auburn today. Let's Corporate. really dive into that. And Pat McAfee starts screaming at the top of his lungs. It's totally different. It works for some people. It doesn't work for some people. I'm fine with him being on game day as somebody who has consumed game day traditionally for a long time because – I do like his style of show and stuff like that. Honestly, the next round and Pat McAfee have a lot uh, of similar, you know, similarities when it comes to the show they ultimately produce every day. Pat is just a, a former NFL player with a massive appeal, but I would say the same thing that works for Pat McAfee works for the next round too, and works for all of us. Like if you were to see us in the movies, we're not going to be any different than we are right here on the microphone. If you were to see those three guys for the next round out at you know, any restaurant or at the movies or at a game or whatever, they're going to still be the same people. Pat McAfee, I firmly believe if I were just to run to Pat McAfee yeah. out in the wild at a Walmart or something, he'd still be the crazy dude I see on TV. He wouldn't be like totally different. Skip Bayless, Stephen A. Smith to an extent, I think he's calmed down a little bit, but a lot of those people, Colin Cowherd, they are turn on the personality when the microphone's on, when they walk out that door, it's like, okay, anyway, what was I doing? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that person at all. And we've worked with plenty of people in radio that are that way too, that what they are on microphone is totally and different when they get off the microphone. I've run into people who think you can't be critical of these guys. They're at the top of their craft. They're getting paid millions and millions of dollars. And my argument is I hate the format and I hate the way that these guys continue to keep that format alive. I just hate inauthentic yelling at each other for the sake of let's create conflict. So that way it'll sell it to people. Tyler, I assume you're not a huge fan of that style of content either. Oh, not at all. I think a pod, whether it's a podcast or a, a, a TV show, if you're going too far in the direction of build it, creating controversy or too far in the direction of creating a positive space where no one argues, you get a completely uninteresting show that I have no desire to watch. I'm with you. Well said. It's all about when it comes to ESPN, when it comes to its future, when it comes to Disney, it's all about having the right plan. John, we already have the right plan with and our they, friends. They can't segue as good as you either. They can't. Uh, with our friends at Way to Wellness, where they have a plan for you, a plan for me, a plan for everyone who shows up to deal with Leslie and her board certified team. Go to a plan for me.com. You can figure out your own personal plan. You can get that consultation with Leslie and her whole board certified team there at way to wellness. I'm on the program. Tim's on the program. Jim Dunaway is on the program. My dad's on the program. And guess what? We're all very open about being on that program and what it's doing for us in our lives. So go to a plan for me.com. Get that consultation, get your own plan developed specifically for you. A plan for me.com. All right. Can I you, say one more thing about the ESPN thing? I'm always yeah. one thing. Uh, why, why are you looking and talking like that? You're, yes, of course you can. Well, I don't want to, like, I know you you're moving on. Oh God. No. Yeah. You got a rhythm going, but I, I did, before you, if you're, by the way, part of my show prep today, I just want to be completely transparent, included nothing about ESPN discussion. See, it they're taking over the world happened naturally. <laughs> well, none I disagree of, with you. None <laughs> of this was orchestrated. Yeah. So the ESPN, all talking about the replacement of Bob Iger and you're saying, get rid of ESPN. Do they get rid of Iger? He finds his replacement and then the fall guy goes like, Oh, by the way, you're the guy that's going to cut ESPN. Is that going to be the kind of thing? Like you're going to be the guy that makes these big, well, I bad. Think, I don't think he's a fall guy. If he's making the right move for the company, but I don't, a lot of people are going to argue against like, Whoa, like the ESPN, like you're, I, you're the bad guy to ESPN. It's also why I said, don't hire Jimmy Pitaro. Cause he's the head of ESPN right now. So I feel like yeah. you, you can't, yeah. So I'm saying like, I hire him. Hey, buy ESPN. You're out. If you read Iger's book, which I have, and it's really good, and I think it's called The Ride of a Lifetime is what his biography is called. And he, he came from the sports world. He came from Olympics coverage. He came from being in that production booth and working his way literally up from intern to CEO. Like, that is how he approached this. He sees tremendous value in ESPN, but so much so that he 
will maybe even overvalue it to a bidder that would be happy to come in, make the deal. And that would be looked at, I think, by the company, its shareholders, as being a net positive for the company to be able to sell that now before cable continues to plummet to the point yeah. where ESPN has to sell. Hey, Bob Iger gets a $50 billion check from Apple and walks out the door. It's yeah. like, we got $50 billion. If, if you can sell out of want instead of need, that's a much more powerful piece of leverage to have. And right now ESPN has got a bunch of tough things ahead in its future. Cause what is ESPN without the game rights? What is ESPN without the game rights? What is left? Not much. Talking heads and 30 for 30. Not much. And not even 30 for 30. They, haven't they stopped pr- basically producing those for the most part? Right. I mean, none Seems of them are like as it. high profile. They're yeah. running out of things there. And they even took that from Bill Simmons. I'm about to say Sans Bill Simmons. They even took that from Bill Simmons who didn't get the credit. That's another thing that makes me angry. We won't get into Bill Simmons yeah. and the way he was treated. ESPN. 30 minutes on Grantland. Here we go. We won't get into the way Conan was treated. There well, from, I mean, we, 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 we were in different spots in the world. <laughs> we were just different sp- people. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. Well, That's I'm good. Hello, Pittsburgh. Okay. <laughs> I don't find that funny. No. John, you want to have a authentic argument here? Oh, God. Pick Kevin your boy. Eubanks. I'm going to give you two options. Pick your boy. Christopher Nolan okay. or Jonathan Nolan. Is this about to be a Westworld conversation? Yes. Well, I mean, be John, honest. Jonathan Nolan. You love Jonathan Nolan more than Christopher Nolan. I be love honest. Jonathan Nolan, but Christopher Nolan has a much broader and overall better body of work. I'm just kidding. We're not about to argue, but I'm about to tell you some information that may make you somewhat happy. Okay. Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy behind Fallout, by the way. So That's why we're talking about this. Yeah. Jonathan <laughs> Nolan, he's out there promoting Fallout on Amazon. It's going to be a huge series. Comes out this month. Debuts a week from tomorrow. A week from tomorrow's Fallout dropping on Prime. I know Tyler's very excited about it. You can check out our trailer reaction, which is up on the channel. If you have not yet subscribed, please do so. But could Westworld be coming back? In an interview here recently with The Hollywood Reporter, this was the question that was asked. Is there any possibility that Westworld's originally planned ending will be dramatized in any form, whether as a graphic novel or a movie or anything? Do you still have hopes for that? Here was the answer. Yes, 100%. We're completionists. It took me eight years and a change of director to get Interstellar made. We'd like to finish the story we started. Now, I know you love Interstellar, which is another reason to love Jonathan Nolan and his contributions. Look, I love Jonathan Nolan too, but there's no doubt the things in which he's been hands-on with and created, you have absolutely loved. It may be that way again with Fallout. Do you have any hope that Westworld comes back in some way to finish the story? I have hope it will never be on HBO or Max or anything Warner Brothers because the whole reason that show ended up getting canceled was number one, it had fallen off from season one. But number two, they were in the midst of canceling everything they could possibly cancel. I mean, let's look at Batgirl. Let's look at the movies they pulled to try to, you know, the way Disney's taking a $200 million tax cut on, on the uh, Star Wars Hotel, Warner Brothers is doing with a bunch of their properties. Looney Tunes, or sorry, uh, Coyote versus Acme. Yep, another one. And they, they, got, they wanted to get rid of it so bad, they, you cannot even watch Westworld anymore on HBO Max. That is correct. Or Max, excuse me. I'm going to call it HBO Max forever. Hey, let me pause you for one reason, and that is because that was asked directly to Jonathan Nolan. How much did Warner's taking the show off Max bother you to not just cancel it, but to remove it from the streaming service, which I think makes the argument of why physical media is still a very important thing. But yeah. this is what he had to say. It's a very interesting high road approach, I think. Look, my career began on CBS with person of interest. The amount of people you can reach with a free ad-supported service like Roku or Tubi, which had Westworld last year, is vastly higher than with a subscription service. That part didn't bother me. But in terms of finishing the story, you understand that you get the time that you get. Sometimes it's as much as you want. Sometimes it's not. I'm so blanking proud of what we made. It was an extraordinary experience. I think it would be a mistake to look back and only feel regret over how it ended. But there's still very much a desire to finish it. I think that's an awesome answer. It's the same way Conan pretty much approached what happened to him. All of this stuff seems to be tying in one way or another. But what a lovely response of, 
I don't care about that relationship that soured, which by the way, Warner brothers souring their relationship with both Nolans. How do you do that? Hopefully they can bring them back into the fold at some point. And if I'm Christopher Nolan and I'm going back, I'm making a plea for, okay, well, you know, Jonathan should be able to come back too. He produces a lot of stuff anyway. Exactly. But I find that to be a very interesting approach about it's about as many people as possible witnessing it. And they were able to do it through other series. I mean, other uh, hosts rather than just Warner brothers deciding whether or not this product lives or dies. And and the thing that gives me hope that it'll come back too is there's an article with uh, Evan Rachel Wood. I don't know what it was, but it was a few months ago who played Dolores was the pretty much the main character in Westworld that they're like, okay, well, Hey, you know, by the way, can you tell us how it ended? Like, what did Jonathan Nolan tell you? She's like, I have no earthly idea. He has kept it so secret because he cares about it. It's coming back. Like one way or the other, you're going, everybody is going to see the ending to this one way or another. And honestly, I would be fine if some studio went and said, here's 50 million bucks, make a movie. If you can with that and do, do a two hour movie ripe for a movie. It seems it ripe for it. I mean, it was already a movie to begin with, the, yeah. which is what it came from. Um, Inspired Michael Myers and Halloween and the creation of that character. Yeah. So I, I fully believe it'll happen. I think if it does, it likely will be Amazon. Hey, we got money. Do something or Netflix. Hey, we got money. Do something or Apple. It's, it actually seems prime for an Apple style show, but Something will happen with it, I firmly believe, but it will not be on Max. As the show, as we know it, on Max is done. I just hope whoever does buy it then pulls the whole thing in and says, hey, come watch the show here. Because I would love to go back and rewatch. The fourth season, I thought, was actually really well done. And it's the kind of ending that I've had to convince myself, you know, that's not a bad way if it has to end right now. It's not a terrible way to end right there. But But they clearly left it on a cliffhanger of, we got one more season in us. They said from the beginning, basically, because Ed, uh, Ed Harris was in a uh, doing an interview something for something totally unrelated, and it's like, hey, Westworld, by the way. And he's like, oh, yeah, we're working on season five right now. And then, like, HBO canceled it, like, a week later. Um, so it's it, it's in everybody's mind, like, we got to go. And especially in Nolan's mind, we got to go. Hey, Christopher, go help, go help your bro out and, you know, use that power, too, to make it happen. We'll see. Jonathan Nolan, by the way, he's the one that came up with the line in The Dark Knight, quote, You either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. It's one of the most iconic lines of the past 20 years in cinema. And Jonathan Nolan, that was his pen to paper. Let's talk about rock music. Okay. With rock star. All right. The band that was formed by Gene Simmons and co-founder Paul Stanley in 1973 has now announced what the future entails. They retired. Variety confirms that rock and roll hall of famers kiss have sold their music catalog, their name, and their iconic makeup designs to Pop House Entertainment, the Sweden-based music investment firm behind ABBA's Voyage hologram show. While terms of the deal were not officially announced, Bloomberg and Associated Press said it was worth upwards of $300 million for the entirety of KISS to be able to be replicated for years to come. We've ta- we talked about this very subject earlier this week. What do you think about Kiss living forever now through selling its complete name, image, and likeness to this Swedish group who's already had success with ABBA Voyage that's grossed more than a million dollars per year. I'm sorry, a million dollars per week. And last year, there's been announcements to take the show around the world with Las Vegas recently rumored as a destination. This type of, you love this band, come see this show. The band can be in five different places at once. There's a big business opportunity here with just keeping on replaying the old hits, and they paid a pretty penny $300 million to be able to secure those rights. This is the world we live in now, and there's going to be more acts that sell their name, image, and likeness. There's going to be Hollywood stars that potentially sell their name, image, and likeness in order to be able to be replicated for years to come. Yes, and does that take us down the road where it's going to be like somebody sells the rights to Marilyn Monroe where she can appear in the next Batman movie? Yes, that's the thing that's, that's going to be disturbing. That's to me. what I'm saying. And now that's what a the lot of the strikes thing is not as about. weird, but but like people that have already passed that have no say. Because I know George Carlin, somebody George Carlin's uh, daughter had to shut some documentary or something down that they're going to have a George Carlin uh, AI thing perform a concert or something, a stand up routine. And his his daughter was like, absolutely not. I, we're not giving you permission. They had to shut it down. But just like to not have a choice where James Dean's going to be in the news, Fast and the Furious. Like, no, come on, <laughs> come on now. I'd go watch it. I mean, uh, I know you would. But so that's what we're going to, and I think with Kiss, does that finally mean that Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley in no way, in no shape, no form can do a live show from now on as Kiss 
and doing uh, rock and roll or not. We're like, that's not yours anymore. We bought that from you. You can't put that makeup oh, on they anymore. Own, they own everything. That's what I'm saying. So that finally put it into Kiss. Just keep on showing up. And like, no, no, no. This is the last. We're going to do one more time. We're going to do the Tonight Show as a, as a farewell. Like, hopefully that put that to bed where they're like Motley Crue with these oh. – Awful retirements. This is the last tour we're ever going to do. Leonard what Skinner. you're going to see is the digital version of them booked yeah. in these places because we've got to show off the technology. If you're still going around, then what did we pay for? Like, we, we need you to go inter- away. We all, yeah, we also got to interview Gene and Paul about what made you do this. Well, the money. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this is what KISS co-founder Gene Simmons said. Quote, we have always been breaking new ground in popular culture, and mm-hmm. this partnership will ensure that we continue to do so for money. years to come because what Pop House is doing is breaking rules. Money. We already have several plans in development. Several but, transactions. So I, but Adam was the made, first one that did it, though, so it's not groundbreaking. No, but we're the first ones that wear makeup. <laughs> <laughs> we're the first ones that have a coffin. Yeah. So was Kiss also breaking new ground and breaking rules when they had a whole line of pinball machines and they have a credit all card. this? Yeah. It, does that take that away? Does that place own all those rights now? The, all the Chris ke- credit cards, the Kiss Detroit dolls. Rock City was the first movie ever made that featured a band in it. They yeah. bought... Everything Is that, that before can... Rock and Roll High School then? Because that had the Ramones. <laughs> they yes. can, they bought everything you could possibly buy when it comes to the rights of KISS. Uh, so this is going to be something. So they own Detroit Rock City too. Okay. Yeah. Pop House CEO Per Sundin at the time of the deal said, quote, our partnership will fuse the rich history and iconic status of KISS with cutting edge technology allowing fans now and in the future to experience the band like never before. Mm-hmm. If you do plan on kissing someone soon, visit my friends at Alabama <laughs> Dental Associates. That's the only reason you brought this story up. No. I'm so happy to have a dental team that I have found as a solution to my dental care needs. Located on Grant's Mill Road, they'll make you the best kissers possible at Alabama Dental Associates. Led by Dr. Jeff and Dr. Brian, make sure that you reach out to them as they're ready to help you with all of your dental care needs. They make sure they take care of you. They have all the latest Dental health technology, so you know that you're receiving the most advanced care possible, but it's really the friendliness of the staff. They care about you as an individual. They want to make sure that your patient experience is top-notch. They've helped me with multiple things that I've gone through with my dental health, and they've made it an easy process. And I thank them for that. I appreciate their support of this show, and I hope that you will support them by reaching out, making an appointment today at 205-956-8977. They're welcoming in. New patients, they're at alabamadental.com as they look forward to seeing you. All right, it's time to get to Luntz's list. As mentioned, John is headed up to the Music City and has an important task to complete before he goes. With so many different movie soundtracks that have become iconic, how will Lunsford narrow down the choices to his top five? Let's get ready to discuss his personal picks on another brand new edition of Luntz's List. John, other than Space Jam, which was raved about yesterday, name the five movie soundtracks that have earned your respect is being up there with the very best lyrical compilations in all of cinema history. There's a couple of things that I put as parameters on this list. I'm not talking about film scores here. That's a whole separate discussion. I'm talking about integrating other music or even original music with lyrics into a movie and making it work. This is a list that should be exclusively judged on how well the film's featured songs with notable lyrics, artists, and certain emotional beats and certain beats of the music itself, the albums chosen can either be full of original songs developed for the movie or existing songs that perfectly complemented the movie. And I'm asking for no movie musicals to be a part of this because a lot of those... So I can't use Mamma Mia from ABBA. A lot of those are adapted, (laughs) but I want you to see if you can work with the parameters and create a list that you believe in. Do you believe in this list? Uh... Yes, it's tough because there's a lot of really good ones. Would you let, have let me use Mamma Mia? Because it's all ABBA music. So I would say yes. I, I, I would say I would say yes. I would have probably let you use that one, but I appreciate you not because I have. I <laughs> don't really want to talk about Mamma Mia. Don't today. get me wrong. I like Mamma Mia. 
but I would not admit it. How did Pierce Brosnan it. doing that? It, 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 from what I've heard, it's not that great. Pierce yeah. Brosnan and Mamma Mia. Him, Stellan Skarsgård, and Colin Firth, I think, were the three dads in yeah. it. That none of them are We've incredible. We've met our Mamma Mia quota of the week. <laughs> With plenty of Avatar. Um, let me say this. The, there's one I did not include. I'm going to go ahead and say it because you may be the same kind of thing. Like, oh, you could have used that. I feel like it's score, and it was very much not score soundtrack that probably would have been at number one for me is Tron Legacy because Daft Punk did the score for that while creating new songs for that. I counted that more as score as opposed to soundtrack. I don't know how you would count that. I actually that. thought this would be your number one on Lunce's list today. So Okay. Well, I'm getting it out of the way that I count that as more That's of a fine. score, so I'm That's fine. spoiling that that would have been I don't want one. people to be confused by this, but like, let's use something for Jaws, for instance, okay? I love Jaws. Got a big poster of it up on the wall that you can't see, but I promise you it's there. <laughs> Jaws would not count as being a part of this list. But if we were to do film scores, it would count because that dun dun Yeah. Dun 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 dun. And the music in that is incredible. I talked about before the show, I finished episode two last night. I've been rewatching Star Wars and the music, as, as bad as everybody considers episode two, I feel like a lot of people put it at the bottom of all the movies. The music in that for the set pieces that exist that you roll your eyes at is incredible because John Williams is incredible. But pretty much anything John Williams is in that he makes incredible counts as a score. Therefore, you can't use Stuff like Star Wars, which with scores would probably be near the top, if not oh, at the top for a lot of absolutely. people. Absolutely. John so, Williams anyway. hates this list. I can go ahead and tell you. <laughs> yes. But we could do just literally a whole Luntz's list of best John Williams scores, which I still think the one I have up at the very top, even above anything Star Wars, Superman. I think the Superman theme is so iconic, and it's so good that it has ruined every potential beat piece of superman music oh yes yeah, since like they haven't been able to come up with another superman theme batman's had different themes and they've taken Something superman has not in the okay. way Pittsburgh. okay oh. Number, 50 shades of gray it's that painting movie isn't it 50 shades of gray so this had a heavy weekend influence for sure <sighs> let's talk about it 50 shades right. of gray the only way this would probably make Luntz's list well let me also <laughs> say this so i'm counting 50 shades of gray and this may or may not happen again on the list. I'm not going to include multiple movies from the same franchise. So, like, Fifty Shades of Grey was really good. Fifty Shades Darker was actually really good, too. They, Because it's a movie made for a very female-centric audience that would love pop music, they went out and got every big name in the world to come and do music for it, which ultimately makes a pretty good soundtrack. Taylor Swift was a part of the, the second one. The Weeknd was very heavy in the first one. Obviously, I'm a Weeknd and Taylor Swift person because The Weeknd was up near the top. Daft Punk would have been number one, but then Weekend was there, and of course Taylor Swift. So I think overall the franchise did a really good job with their soundtracks across all three movies. I have never seen any of these movies. I Ooh. never intend to see any of these movies. Uh huh. But sure, I have consumed. John, we believe you. <laughs> but I have consumed the soundtracks all the time. Like it is, they are really good soundtracks. Uh, I know two of the movies had a song nominated for Oscar for an Oscar. Um, the big one was The Weekend from the first one. Zane from One Direction and Taylor Swift was a big one from the second one. I don't remember from the third one who the big song was, but anyway, really good soundtracks overall, really good bands that they pulled in from it. So it's not something that would ever make Lunch's list except for this and best uh, Twilight fan fiction, but that's it. Rockstar does voices that crack me up, and I'd love for you to read that in an Irish accent as if it's pronounced the way it's written up on the board. Do you see what I'm talking about here? <laughs> 50 Shades of Grey. 50, 50 Shades of, all- of, all gr- of, of Grey. Fifty shades of gray. I separated the O and F. Fifty shades of O F gray. Off gray. Oh, he's over there drinking. Okay. Also, I think the gray is G R E Y, not G R A Y. Technically, in the book, but it's okay. Whatever. No one cares. Let's go to number four on Lutz's list. I have no other Fifty Shades of Grey content to get into here. I've already made a joke about Italian dishes at a stripper joint, so I don't know where else I need to go here. John, though, it is weird. He says he's never seen Fifty Shades of Grey, but he really was adamant he wanted to paint this room red. That's what he said constantly. I'm like, why? I agree with him. And he was listening to that song over and over again. All right, number four. Inside Out? No. Okay. I, that's one word? Inside oh, Inside Llewellyn, Llewellyn Davis. Davis. Lewin. Lewin oh. Davis. Llewellyn. 
Oh, how, how did you get Llewellyn yep. from that? In, oh my God! Inside, inside Llewellyn's a hard, uh, hard word to spell. Inside, hard name to spell. L. Inside, Llewellyn Davis. That's what inside I Llewellyn Davis. You know, look, every, it happens every time, and guess what? Ten years from now, it's gonna be the same. I start really big, and then I realize, oh man, I've written one word too big. I got five more words to go, so yeah. I kind of just cram it in there. Anyway, Inside Llewellyn Davis, one of my favorite films of all time. Um, I'm going to not. This has no, these movies have nothing to do with each other other than it's from the same directors. Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou as an honorable mention here as well because they're both Coen Brothers films. Mm. But Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou has an incredible soundtrack. Inside Lewin Davis has an incredible soundtrack. Man of Constant Sorrow was on the radio all yes. the time that year. What, 2001, 2002? I don't know. Sure. Something like that. Anyway, um, I'll say it was just 2000. I don't, anyway. It may have been. Um, Coen Brothers and folk music go together very well um, with really both of these, but... This one stars Oscar Isaac, which if you saw Lunch's list about Dune, you know I'm high on Oscar Isaac. Um, Justin Timberlake is in this one, does uh, pretty good music in it as well. Adam Driver is in this as a musician. Uh, Garrett Hedlund, speaking of Tron Legacy, is in this one. John Goodman's in it. And it's just really good. Kerry Mulligan uh, as well, and they're all basically musicians. Um, really, really solid music, really solid soundtrack. There's no songs that when you hear them, it's like, oh, I've heard that on the radio, but it's a movie that if you watch it, trust me, you'll, you'll hear that soundtrack and you'll be listening to it for a long time afterward. Let's go ahead and head to number three because the chat is going crazy with all different types of suggestions. I'm going to see how many of them pop up on Luntz's list here. Pop star never stop popping is actually a low key. Never very stop fundamental. stopping. Is that what it's called? Yeah, never, it's stop, never stop, stop stopping. stopping. That's never correct. Stop. Never stop. Yeah, stopping. Never stop. Yeah. That's what it is. Never stop, never stopping. Yeah. It's it's a really funny movie it's and great. it's, it's back to Andy right. Samberg, right? It's yeah. all about getting it right, getting that bit right, and I thought it was very funny. Number Baby three. Driver. Babe Pig in oh, the City. Great choice. Great choice. This I don't want to take words out of your mouth, but I'm gonna try. This movie does not work without the soundtrack. This is the best non musical musical ever. Because you're right, it does not work without it. Just go watch the opening scene when he's driving John Hamm, uh, Isaac Gonzalez, and John Bernthal. Was he with them then? Because they're different crews. I'm going to say yes. Um, but when he's driving them away from a bank uh, bank robbery, incredible driving, incredible music in it, really good soundtrack. Um, and the trailer remix of Nowhere to Run that they used in the original trailer was incredible. And I don't think they actually used that remix in the movie. They just used nowhere to run in the movie, but it is nonstop music the entire time. The whole point is that he can't really hear. And so he listens to music while he drives because it's not really going to help him not having music. I, and I know what you're talking about with not using remixed music in the movie that's used in the trailer to sell it because army of the dead, the Dave Batista Netflix, Zack Snyder movie used a great remix of The Gambler. Yeah. And it's not featured in the movie, and you can't really find it anywhere. There's people that have repli tried to replicate it, but I know exactly what you're talking about with that feeling of... I don't remember exactly if they used it, but because the songs are similar, there's just like very much like an orchestral remix almost that's used in the trailer. Really good. Just go look at the first Baby Driver trailer. It's really good. I, this is one of those lists where until we get the full scope of them, it's hard to predict exactly which direction you're going. So let's go ahead and get to number two. I wouldn't even have a problem with you writing number two and number one, which would break some Luntz's list rules here. I could do that. Jeff just mentioned one that I actually thought about, but I didn't include, but it's a good choice. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll just write number so two. none of the ones Jeff mentioned are on your uh, list? There's one that Howard just pointed out to. There's definitely. Oh, there's, uh, is it Team America? <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. Team America making the list. Wasn't that a musical, though? Uh, yeah. It's a musical. It is a musical, really. I mean. We're going to let it slide. Matt Damon. It's not in the name of list, but I'm saying it's a good one. Oh. I'm confused. I'm so confused by what I thought he was saying Team America. He's got to be was talking about list. Guardians of the Galaxy. No. Team America is a good choice since I said I consider it, but I didn't include it because it is a musical. Guys, we're here all day. This is not a screaming another, show, John. Another fun game could be uh, people that don't know what's going on take a picture of that and say, what the hell do you think this top five is? Uh, <laughs> what this top five is? Bingo. Yeah. That would be great. Bingo. Um, I don't know, unnecessary sex scenes? <laughs> like, no. Okay, so number two is Ready Player One. And number one is <laughs> Guardians. I agree Guardians had to be on this list. Yes. Easy number one. I worked my way back from that. Had to be that. Um, Which is why I was okay with you writing the final two, because I was like, it's got to be up there. And Ready Player One, similar 
genre, similar time coming from the 80s and all, but uh, really, really good soundtrack there as well. Obviously, the entire thing is very 80s influenced See, because of when it was created, but... This is, um, Go ahead. I feel like you took a giant dump on Back to the Future again, because Back to the Future deserves to be on this list. Back to the Future is fine. In the place of Ready Player One. Oh. I'll take that too. I would take Just because they used the DeLorean in no, it? No, Huey Lewis... Kills it on that soundtrack. Kills it on there. Uh, Forrest Gump <laughs> had a great soundtrack. Forrest Gump, one of my honorable like, mentions. Singles had to be, if you didn't put singles on there, ridiculous. My honorable mentions. Jeff has that as his number one. Yeah. Forrest Gump, Ferris Bueller, Drive. Only reason I didn't include Drive is because Drive is very much like one or two songs played over and yeah, over and over again. Now, they are great songs, and they influence our favorite band, but that's it. It's not a full good soundtrack. Donnie Darko had a good soundtrack. Call Me By Your Name has kind of a sneaky, good soundtrack. Um, and then Tron Legacy was one I, I felt like I couldn't really include on there. Movies but. with great lyrical soundtracks. Another one that should have been on here is Rocky Four, which is fantastic. Thought about think, the Rocky, any Rocky movie, but yeah. I think Rocky Four is my favorite movie soundtrack maybe of all time. It's definitely up there. But I don't have a... A lot of major complaints other than maybe Back to the Future should have gotten some love. But. See, like Jeff included, he had Guardians, Team America. Lion King doesn't count. I count that as a musical. Or else I would have done something like that. Um, <laughs> Jody, Was Pulp Fiction anywhere in your consideration? Because I, yeah, think Guardian, I think the Guardian soundtrack doesn't exist if Quentin Tarantino doesn't dig up uh, no. Urge Overkill. Why, have I, why would I not include Pulp Fiction? Because what? you have not seen Pulp Fiction. I've not seen any Tarantino movie except for oh. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Well, yeah. there you go. <laughs> John has an interesting... We've never gotten into this publicly on the air. You think he's too good looking? We'd, John <laughs> well, has... Obviously, we would go on for hours with this debate. We don't need to do that, but he has certain parameters of films he does not want to watch, but yet he'll break those rules sometimes, but then come back and say, I've refused to break those rules, but then he'll watch something. I'll be like, well, that breaks your rules again. And you're like... But not really. I can handle that. And then, you know, so we'll get into that a whole nother time. We do not have time for that discussion. You've got to get to Nashville, Tennessee. 89 Batman, by the way, also honorable mention. There's one that I thought was sort of a, a gimme on 89 here. Batman. Yeah, what's yeah with, with Prince. Yeah. Prince doing the soundtrack on that. Okay. Well, I'm just like, uh, but then, okay. Party Man, Trust. I mean, a lot of Batman. Calling I mean, Vicky. Multiple Batmans had good music, but. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw a lot of love for the Batman Forever soundtrack I, I, in the chat. I, I'd go to the original. Kiss from a Rose, Bat Dance. Plus, I would include, I'd probably one. include them all. Hold me, throw me, kiss me, kill me. Kind of get it with Guardians. Anyway, continue. You really didn't have that poppy soundtrack for Batman Returns. You didn't have that. Uh, you had that song Gotham City that was done by, I don't remember who it was done by, but it was really popular, I think, for Batman and Robin. But Star is Born. I consider that a musical. How? They don't break out into song to advance the story. They perform, they're concert performers. They have to be able to do their jobs in the movie. I think A Star is Born, I understand, but if I said it was clear and free to go, would it make this list? Yeah. That's all I need to be. I don't consider A Star is Born It'd to be a musical. probably be number two. I'd probably still keep behind Guardians, but I'd probably. Do you consider Bohemian two. Rhapsody to be a musical? I consider what they did with Rocket Man was a musical. What they did with Bohemian Rhapsody was not a musical, in my opinion. It's on the feds for me. Okay. In, well, anything like that, I kind of keep with Bohemian same vein. Rhapsody. Make your list. Probably not. Well, no. What about Walk the Line or something where it's literally uh, Ru- not your uh, style. Joaquin, not Johnny no, but, Cash in my style. I know, but Joaquin Phoenix doing the entire soundtrack as oh. Johnny Cash. Well, that's. I mean, I can appreciate it, but yeah, I mean, just Johnny Cash. I don't care who's doing it. Johnny yeah. Cash in general probably wouldn't make my style, but. I mean, there, there's there's a difference between Mamma Mia and those movies, mm-hmm. but there's also a difference between those movies and these movies too. Yeah. To where I feel I like agree. all of those are, no pun intended, walking the line of what yeah. is and what isn't. That is definitely pun intended. Let's be <laughs> honest here. Varsity Blues is good too. Brian mentioned that. I kind of considered that too. Okay, my we're favorite, in the my favorite uh, sports movie. We're in the home stretch here of this edition of the Meltdown. By the way, if you're looking for a home. In your life, whether you're buying or selling, Realtor Jim Wilson, that should be your guy. With Location Real Estate, when looking for that new place to call home, remember our friend with Location Real Estate, Jim Wilson, an active member of the U.S. military, good guy, ready to help you with all of your home buying or home selling needs, able to help you secure that American dream of finding that perfect piece of property 
that you will call home. Each of Jim Wilson's clients has his full energy when looking to accomplish their real estate goals, not only during the home buying or selling experience, but every day after he is committed for you and your interests, not some random corporation. You can trust Jim Wilson with Location Real Estate at 205-329-4758. That's 329-4758 or visit jimwilson.locationre.com. We appreciate Jim very much. And John, we also appreciate our title sponsor. That's my bookie. Go to mybookie.ag, March Madness this weekend. Go bet on the Tide, see if they can win as an underdog, make that money. Or you can go bet on anything in the NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball. You can also play slots. You can also play in their live casino. Just use promo code next round when you make that first deposit. You'll get a bonus on us. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with our friends at my bookie. By the way, Gotham City done by R. Kelly. R. Kelly. Why do I keep bringing up R. Kelly songs this week? This <laughs> is the know, second is, time I've second done time this. you've done it. Was it Batman and Robin that that was on the soundtrack yeah. for? Yeah. But it made me giggle. <laughs> so I was like, you keep bringing up R. Kelly for some reason. I don't know what it <laughs> What's is. What's he up to these days? <laughs> is, is he doing a new album? Him and Diddy. <clears throat> That's going to do it. There's no way to end this show and <laughs> land this bird, but I'm going to try it. This has been The Meltdown. We appreciate Tyler, Rocky, John, all of you in the chat, you've been awesome today. Let's keep that going as we're going to have a fun Friday edition tomorrow. Hopefully, John, you will be back from your Nashville Predators having a win tonight. I'm rooting for your team this evening. And the Dallas Stars continue to win. All they can do is win right now. They are on a hot streak, and I hope it continues. I'm Tim Melton signing off for the Meltdown here as we've been broadcasting live from the Culver Studio presented by MyBookie.